The problem is that's going to come right up to the beginning of the Christmas Hanukkah potential surge. So you have a surge upon a surge. So if those two things happen and we don't mitigate well, we don't listen to the public health measures that we need to follow, that we could start to see things really get bad in the middle of January. Without substantial mitigation, the middle of January can be a really dark time for us. Right now, we are seeing hundreds of thousands of new cases every single day, thousands of deaths every day. And Dr. Fauci says January could be a really dark time for us, which makes you wonder, what does a really dark time actually look like? Well, here it is. A new study from the University of Washington projects that despite vac vaccination scale up, we expect 539,000 cumulative deaths by April the 1st with peak daily deaths reaching 3,000 in mid to late January. That is a lot to take in, and it's really hard news that more than half of a million Americans will die, may die. And this president is using the last days of his administration, holding super spreader rallies and claiming he won the election that he didn't win. And another member of his inner circle, Rudy Giuliani, just tested positive after running around the country, pushing baseless conspiracy theories about the election. We, of course, wish him a speedy recovery. And we hope no one he might have exposed in Arizona in that legislature gets sick. This administration has done every single thing wrong since the beginning of the pandemic. And there's absolutely no reason to think that they will change in the next 44 days before Trump leaves office. Help is thankfully on the way in the form of a vaccine and the public health team Joe Biden just rolled out. But in the meantime, we're pretty much on our own. Starting us off tonight, Dr. Mario Ramirez. He's an emergency physician and the former coordinator of pandemics and emerging threats at the Department of Health and Human Services and Molly John Fast. She's editor, editor at large of For the Daily Beast and a participant in the Pfizer vaccine trials. Dr. Ramirez, I'll start with you. Just We just went through a lot of bad news. I mean, it's so hard to take in every day you wake up. You know, the number of deaths is growing. The number of hospitalizations is growing. But there is some good news on the horizon. The FDA could authorize a vaccine as soon as this week. If they do that, when will the first doses be administered to the American people? So it should be pretty soon after that, Zerlina. Um, Pfizer has already started to pre-position uh, hundreds of thousands of doses around the country. And if the EUA is approved, uh, the expectation and the hope is that vaccines should start being given within 48 to 72 hours of that approval. That is good news. Um, and as we've been talking uh, all last week and the week before that, in terms of the order of distribution, obviously it was going to frontline workers and those who are most vulnerable. Uh, and it is going to be some time before we can just get it at CVS, of course. Uh, follow up, Dr. Ramirez, in the same uni University of Washington study I mentioned at the top, researchers found that if we wear masks, literally just that, if we all just wear masks over our faces, we can save 66,000 lives by April, potentially. Are masks simply the most important tool in our arsenal in between now and the time we can get that vaccine? So masks are one of the most important tools, but the other most important tools, Erlina, and I can't stress this enough, you know, is social distancing. You know, unfortunately, we have so much disease that is spread over so much of the country now that we have really breached that period where people can continue to believe that they can socialize with other people, expect a mask is going to protect them. Um, masks are helpful, but they don't completely prevent the spread of disease. And we've really entered a new, more dangerous phase of the pandemic where the most sort of reliable way that you can keep from getting infected is to try to minimize your contact with people outside of your household. So you're, you're saying something a little bit different than the advice a couple of months ago. You know, over the summer where there wasn't as much community spread, um, you could probably maybe meet up with friends and sit outside with your masks, socially distanced, but, you know, maybe think that that was a pretty, pretty safe uh, activity. Now, though, you're saying it's so widespread throughout the country, Dr. Ramirez, that you really should stay within the walls of your household in terms of contact with others? 
So there are certainly some folks that are going to have to go to work and will have to be around other people to maintain core functioning parts of this economy right now. But what's important, and the reason I think you've heard a similar message from other public health folks over the last few weeks, is that the U.S. health system is at a fundamentally different place from where we were at just a few months ago and even a few weeks ago. Um, you know, when we look at the hospital indicators across multiple markets, there are thousands of hospitals that are reporting staff shortages, bed shortages. And the, you know, the common denominator in the spring was always that we were going to try to flatten the curve to make sure that we didn't breach health system capacity. But that capacity has now been breached. And the message that people need to understand is that if you get sick from COVID or even from anything else, that if you come to a hospital, our ability to help you at one of those hospitals is extremely limited. And that's why it's become more dangerous to be around other people right now. It's important context. Molly, tell us about your experience with the Pfizer vaccine trial. I think a lot of people have questions uh, about the, the vaccines that they've heard about in the news. What was it actually like and why did you decide to do it? So I decided to do it because I saw that a lot of people had questions and I was worried that we were going to have a lot of people not taking this vaccine. And I knew it was important that people who were out there and writing pieces and should should show and demonstrate that it was safe. And so I felt like I was a good person to do it. So I applied to a bunch of different trials and I finally got into the Yale uh, part, a sort of Yale um, uh, hospital for, you know, their vaccine trial for Pfizer. And um, it was a really interesting and uh, kind of amazing experience. And I became a little bit friendly with my study doctors who were really impressive people, um, infectious disease experts and just like incredible people. But what I learned what you know, I didn't have any side effects. And just anecdotally, uh, nobody, most people in the trial thought they had gotten the placebo. So it really is a very well tolerated vaccine. And so that's very exciting. That is exciting. And I mean, I think when when folks at home who may have been concerned hear that you didn't personally have any side effects and others that you know in the same trial uh, didn't experience side effects, that is one um, detail that folks would want to know in terms of the safety um, of, of the vaccines. Dr. Ramirez, the president is holding a vaccine summit, whatever that means, uh, tomorrow at the White House. I, I'm really not sure what this is going to be or um, what's what, what's going to do for the American people, but we'll see. Um, they didn't invite anybody from the Biden transition, to my point. Um, and now we're learning that both Moderna and Pfizer aren't going either. <laughs> um, given all of that, uh, what's the point of the vaccine summit if no of none of the important folks are going to be in attendance? That's a great question, Zerlina. And I, you know, I don't know the right answer. Um, you know, ideally, you would want to have a summit where you have all the right people involved. And those in, include your vaccine uh, producers, as well as the folks that are going to be taking over the actual distribution of your vaccine. You know, but I think the question that you're asking, right, is, is what is, what are the politics and the concerns around this? Uh, you know, and I think, Clearly, that point has been made many times about the Trump administration's politicization of the response to this pandemic. And so, you know, my hope, right, along the whole way has been that we can remove politics from this discussion. And, you know, there are concerns that this summit, you know, is trending down that road. And, you know, what we're trying to do is get the public to buy into the validity and the value of this vaccine. And having a summit that, you know, runs the risk of highlighting the politics around this is just detrimental to the whole effect. Yeah, in terms of that piece, Molly, uh, the politicization of the entire pandemic response has been one of the through lines from the beginning. Um, Because Donald Trump at this point, he just wants credit. Um, You know, he wants to be the person that we all credit with getting the vaccine. Um, Do you see it that way? And do do you think he deserves any credit? No, (laughs) I think that he's made life a lot harder for everyone. And it's and and it's funny because it's like, the only part of this that he really cared about was the vaccines. Like we could have saved so many lives just with mask wearing Mm -hmm. and testing and tracing. And if you look at a country like South Korea who had their first case around the same time we had our first case, if he had just done these simple things, we wouldn't have hundreds of thousands of people dead and we wouldn't be on track for more. So it's sort of interesting to me that the only thing he's interested in is this vaccine. 
And you can't sort of preach this anti-science rhetoric and then at the last minute be like, vaccines are great, right? Because a lot of his supporters have already like heard him say all of these negative things about doctors and scientists. And even remember when he did a, um, a rally and they were saying, fire Fauci, right? Like this is the guy uh -huh. who is now gonna tell you to take the vaccines. So I think it, this is gonna backfire and it's unfortunate because human lives are at stake. Absolutely. Dr. Ramirez, last uh, minute here. We mentioned that public that public health uh, team uh, that President-elect Biden rolled out. It includes California Attorney General Javier Becerra at HHS and Vivek Murthy uh, reprising his role as Surgeon General. How encouraged are you by the Biden, uh, by the team that, that President-elect Biden has put together so far? So I think these are all great picks. You know, my experience at HHS, uh, you know, were, was that the organization itself is a very large bureaucracy. Uh, you know, and I think one of the questions that a lot of folks have had uh, about uh, Javier Becerra is whether he, you know, is not a doctor uh, or doesn't have an adequate health background. But the truth is that to move an organization like HHS, you need to be able to move parts of a bureaucracy very efficiently. And I think he's clearly shown that he can do that. And I think there are all the reasons to believe that he can be successful in the role, particularly if he surrounds himself with other capable folks like the former Surgeon General who's going to reprise that role. Dr. Murthy is a very capable physician, uh, you know, has shown that he gives great advice uh, to the president-elect. And so, you know, I think this is a strong team that will go on to do really great things at HHS. Well, the American pe people's lives are uh, hanging in the balance and very hopeful um, that all of these experts can get in there and get to work so that um, as uh, the least amount of Americans are affected by this as possible. Dr. Mary Ramirez and Molly Jong Fest, thank you so much for being here and stay safe. What do Michigan, Georgia, and Arizona all have in common? They're all places President Trump's personal attorney, Rudy Giuliani, traveled to last week before he learned he tested positive for COVID-19. Giuliani attended events with lawmakers and witnesses without wearing a mask, putting himself, everyone around him, and everyone those people came into contact with at risk. As a result of Giuliani's diagnosis, the Michigan House will not be in attendance tomorrow, and the Arizona Capitol is shut down for the entire week. The Trump campaign says no lawmakers or reporters are on the contact tracing list under current CDC guidelines. They also say Giuliani didn't test positive until more than 48 hours after he got home. But people are still concerned. In Arizona alone, Giuliani reportedly spent more than 11 hours with at least 15 current and former Republican lawmakers. And joining me now is Reginald Bolding. He's a Democratic state representative in Arizona. Thank you so much for being here. Have you have had any contact in person with Rudy Giuliani or uh, the lawmakers that he went, met with when he visited there? So first, I want to say thank you for having me on. Um, I personally haven't had any contact with uh, Rudy Giuliani. Uh, I do know that there were members of the Republican Party that were meeting with Mr. Giuliani that also attended the state capitol. And that was extremely problematic because we had new member orientation, a time in which members should have been incredibly excited to attend the state capitol. Uh, there, they were actually fearful because they know that some members were attending large gatherings with no masks. It is really scary because I think people have to understand it's not just you, right? It's everyone within the walls of your household. And you've heard anecdotally so many people who are going to their jobs and doing the right things, um, but other people are, are putting them um, you know, in harm's way. And then they're exposing their wives or their spouses and family members. And you tweeted earlier today that you hope those members that were exposed are isolating and getting tested so that it doesn't spread further. Have you heard anything from them about how they're feeling or whether or not they're getting tested to make sure that they're not transmitting this virus beyond uh, the state leg legislature? Look, we all want to return to normal. We want the economy. We want our schools to be open. We also want to protect our family and friends from the pandemic. But we have a personal responsibility to slow the spread of the pandemic and eliminate the virus as quickly as possible. And that's exactly why I call for stronger leadership, stronger steps from the top to the bottom. And that means that we have to have the governor 
and also those members who irresponsibly have put themselves in positions to infect others, we have to make sure that they, they slow the spread and they're following the medical advice that's been given to us. Arizona was not the first place Giuliani went last week. When you saw the videos of him in those hearings not wearing a mask and not social distancing, what did you think? You know, it's completely irresponsible. You know, and when you have the president of the United States uh, attorney going across the country and gathering in large groups, supporting those individuals who are at uh, hearings that we know the outcome of those won't mean anything. It's, it's, tr it's truly irresponsible. And what it's doing is putting more people at risk. Right now, we have the ability to actually stand up for this country and say that, look, we're going to get this virus under control. And the way that we're going to do that is we're going to act responsibly. And, and that's something that we have to make sure that we're doing. It feels like, you know, you want to make sure that your colleagues in the state legislature have been tested before they come back. Are you worried that when you guys come back next week, they haven't been tested or and they haven't been isolating um, and that they're putting you at risk even when they return? Here in Arizona, the Democratic House, we've had a member who nearly lost his life because of COVID-19. We also have a member that's currently hospitalized today because of COVID-19 and two members, one who lost their father-in-law and the other who lost their mother to COVID within the last week. This is serious. And the demand to the, to the speaker, uh, also to the governor and also to the Senate president, as those individuals who are around Rudy Giuliani, they must get tested, they must get quarantined, and we have to make sure that they're not putting staff, families, members, anyone at risk. Absolutely. It feels to me like everybody has to sort of take uh, the recommendations very seriously. Hopefully uh, this will make people do that. Do you think that incidents like this, you know, seeing Rudy Giuliani go on a super spreader tour of his own, um, do you think the fact that he finally, uh, you know, came down with COVID because that's what the science says, you don't follow the advice, eventually you may become exposed. Do you think people now will take mask wearing and some of these health recommendations more seriously? You know, I certainly hope so. I hope that that this is an example that's being set to let individuals know that it doesn't matter who you are, you can catch COVID. But the reality is people like Rudy Giuliani, people like President Trump, they understand the risk that they're taking. I'm concerned about those members of the public who don't understand that risk and believe the rhetoric that they're actually spewing. And that's the concerning part. Because what that's going to do is it's going to cause us to see more people lose their life. Here in Arizona, almost 360,000 people have tested positive. Nearly 7,000 lives have been lost. And we can no longer stand by and watch that happen. Yeah, hopefully people will heed the advice. Representative Reginald Boulding, thank you so much for being here and stay safe. Coming up. Three out of four candidates in those crucial Georgia runoffs hit the debate stage. We'll get into the winners and the losers, losers and also the empty podiums. And I'll be talking to one of the moderators when we return in 60 seconds. It's now officially official. Georgia's Secretary of State has once again certified Joe Biden's election victory after counting the ballots not once, not twice, but three separate times. Now the eyes of the state and the nation turn to two Senate runoffs, which will determine control of the chamber. 
Three out of four candidates took part in the debates last night. Senator David Perdue declined an invitation to participate for the second time after his Democratic challenger, John Ossoff, got the better of him the last time they met. Republican David Perdue has served in the U.S. Senate since 2015. Before his election, he sat on the board of five major corporations and co-founded Purdue Partners, a global trading company. In the other Georgia runoff, Democrat Raphael Warnock spent much of his debate with Republican Kelly Loeffler highlighting her pandemic stock dumping allegations and massive wealth. Leffler, meanwhile, refused to say that Trump lost the election, that of course he lost, while repeating the same attacks on Warnock over and over and over and over again. The Democrats want to fundamentally change America, and the agent of change is my opponent, radical liberal Raphael Warnock. My opponent, radical liberal Raphael Warnock. 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 Radical liberal Raphael Warnock is a socialist. Radical liberal Raphael Warnock. Radical liberal Raphael Warnock. Radical liberal Raphael Warnock. Radical liberal Raphael Warnock. Radical liberal Raphael Warnock is their agent of change. Define that, Kelly, please. Leffler used that phrase at least 13 times last night. Or as one Twitter user put it, if you drank every time she said radical liberal Raphael Warnock, you'd be under the table at this point. <laughs> That's the truth. Joining me now is Greg Bluestein, a political reporter for the Atlanta, Atlanta Journal-Constitution, who was one of the three moderators last night. Greg, today was the last day for Georgians to register to vote in the January runoff, and both parties are working really hard uh, to boost their numbers. There were sub, uh, a lot of rallies this weekend with the president and vice president, obviously the debates last night. What are some of the strategies you're seeing uh, from both the Democratic and Republican candidates as we approach this runoff on January? Yeah, well, a couple of things. Um, you don't ha you didn't have to vote in November to in order to vote in January. So both campaign, all four campaigns, both parties are really trying to get people who, for whatever reason, didn't vote in November to come back out to the polls in January. But also the Democrats are particularly going after the 23,000 or so uh, young folks who turned 18 between November and today um, who are new voters. And so in, in particular, Ossoff, John Ossoff's campaign has a, has a dedicated unit going out to try to register the, the, those teenagers who can now vote for the first time. Well, that's a really smart strategy considering the margin uh, for Joe Biden in the state. Um, he overperformed, obviously, Ossoff and Warnoff, but his margin was 14,000 votes. And so it, it seems to be a smart strategy to go after those 23,000 young people. Loeffler was asked point blank by both moderators and her opponent, Raphael Warnock, if Donald Trump lost the election. Let's play her response. Yes or no, Senator Loeffler, did Donald Trump lose the election? You know, President Trump has every right to use every legal recourse available. In our own state, we've seen time and again that we have investigations that need to be completed. President Trump has now bashed several GOP members in the state, including Governor Kemp, who, who appointed Leffler to the seat back in January. Are you surprised she's continuing to blindly follow Trump in refuting the election? It seems like it's a counterintuitive strategy. Yeah, but also, if you if you consider Republicans in Georgia, he, President Trump is still the most, by far the most popular Republican in Georgia, according to our polls, at least. Um, and so by by conceding his defeat, she risks alienating him and antagonizing him. And for the president to do the same thing that he's doing right now to, to Governor Brian Kemp, which is attacking him on Twitter for refusing his demand to call a special session to overturn the election results. So I think both her and Senator Perdue feel like they can't afford to risk uh, ticking off the president because his Twitter feed could soon be aimed directly at them rather than Governor Kemp. That's a good point. On Saturday, we reported uh, that President Trump uh, called Governor Kemp, actually, and tried to pressure him into calling a special session, as you mentioned, to overturn the results of the election. And it's something that, that the governor says he cannot legally do. So it's interesting that the, Sen the two Republican senators are jumping into this fray, with the state now officially certifying its election results three times, potentially. Do you think Donald Trump will finally leave Georgia alone? <laughs> uh, no, judging by his Twitter feed, because even earlier today, he was back at it 
uh, attacking Governor Kemp. He, he was also attacking Lieutenant Governor Jeff Duncan, another Republican who uh, acknowledged Joe Biden's victory on CNN yesterday. So you've got this weird dynamic where um, these top Republican officials, those two that I mentioned, as, uh, as well as Secretary of State Brad Raffensperger, who've kind of fo formed this unlikely bulwark against Trump's efforts to overturn Georgia's election. And meanwhile, um, other Trump loyalists are either being silent or they're echoing some of his, camp uh, his concerns or they're going whole hog and, 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 and basically seconding everything he's saying about the rigged election. It's really strange because he went there on Saturday and you feel, I, I worked on campaigns, but you want people to go vote. You don't want to tell them uh, that it's going to be hard. You don't want to tell them their vote won't count. You really don't want to discourage them. Um, and in a lot of ways, this kind of messaging suppresses the vote. You know, if Donald Trump is saying the Democrats are going to rig this election too in January, how is that beneficial to David Perdue and Kelly Leffler? It's, it's, it's really hard for them. Um, and that's why they haven't actually said the rigged vote phrase, at least that I've heard. And I asked Senator Leffler point blank about it last night, and she didn't repeat that part, but she, she gave that line that you just heard. Um, but look, they're hearing these thousands of Republican voters at that rally, and then millions across the state are hearing this, these, these competing messages. On the, on the one hand, go vote, go, go vote for the control of the U.S. Senate. On the other hand, that the election was somehow rigged and that your votes might, might not have mattered just a few weeks ago. So how they reconcile, that's gonna be the big question. Most Republicans I've talked to are saying flat out, yeah, they're gonna go vote. But I have talked to um, many Republicans who say that they're torn over whether to vote. Well, the margins are really gonna matter. Um, and as we mentioned, John Ossoff debated an empty lectern yesterday. Here's what the Democrat uh, had to say about Senator Perdue declining his invitation to attend. My message for the people of our state at this moment of crisis is your senator feels entitled to your vote. Your senator is refusing to answer questions and debate his opponent because he believes he shouldn't have to. He believes this Senate seat belongs to him. Greg, why do you think Purdue chose not to attend the debate? I mean, I think the visual of an empty podium is never a good look when you're running for re-election. Could it have anything to do with the fact that the Republicans are, are out fundraising Democrats uh, in Georgia by 400 percent? He feels like he can just get the ads going and he doesn't need to debate. I mean, he is he is basing his message towards conservative media outlets. He has done very few interviews uh, with the Atlanta media. He's done very few interviews around the state. Um, so I think that's on one hand. On the other hand, he is, it seems like, in a better position than Kelly Leffler is, his fellow Republican, because he has already served one term in the U.S. Senate. He, has, he probably has a higher, or at least a, a solid name recognition in the state. And unlike Kelly Leffler, who had a special election with 20 other candidates, um, it, you know, and she got into this runoff with 26% of the vote, he outpolled um, uh, John Ossoff by about 88,000 votes. So I think their, their campaign felt like he was in a better standing and, and was able not to do this. But of course, what it risks is that image you just saw that will be that John Ossoff and his allies will be using through January 5th, which is of the empty podium. Yeah, it's never a good look when it's just the empty podium. Like you can't show up and talk to your constituents because again, these elected officials, they work for the American people. We learned from Democrats in Georgia during the general election that it was really the on the ground grassroots and community organizing that was the key to the victories there. You know, finding Democratic voters all over the state, even in rural communities. Are ads enough for Republicans in the state of Georgia to win or do they also need a robust GOTV strategy? Yeah, the, both both these tickets definitely need that because look, I think they'll I think we'll hit 500 million. We're at 380 million dollars in ads <clears throat> already being spent on on uh, just in the last five or so weeks. Um, so at some point, yes, they're everywhere. Every time you turn on the TV set here, you hear you see the ads. At some point, they have a neutralizing effect. It's that get out the vote efforts and the Democrats, mm -hmm. unlike doing the pen doing doing the um, the summer and the late fall. Uh, when they weren't back out there knocking on doors, they're back out again. They're knocking on doors, they're canvassing, they're doing all the things that they used to do, of course, keeping in mind uh, socially distant and pandemic safety guidelines. Republicans never really left the trail either. They, they, they had maybe a two or three months off, but around June, they, they, hit, they hit those streets again. Um, so Republicans did have a grassroots 
a door to door, you know, kind of on the ground advantage over over Democrats in the general. And now I think both campaigns, both tickets, I should say, because there's four campaigns, but both tickets are back out there um, going door to door again. I mean, I think as a as a former organizer, I'm always a, a big fan of when campaigns realize that television advertisements uh, get fast forwarded through <laughs> because exactly. most people have DVR or uh, Netflix or Prime Video. I mean, or Peacock, and so they are not watching commercials. Greg, there were two more noticeable deflections I saw during the debate last night, both from your line of questioning. First, Kelly Leffler declined to say if members of Congress could be barred from owning stock, which is an important question. And second, Raphael Warnock declined to share his views surrounding court backing, which is a popular question right now. Which candidate do you think was hurt more by their respective uh, and seemingly non-answers? I mean, that's a good question because this entire race is all about mobilizing each party's bases. So already, I'm seeing text messages about uh, from Republicans sending out to GOP supporters about, about Raphael Warnock not answering that Supreme Court question. But at the same time, pretty much every headline I read uh, about the debate coverage involved uh, Kelly Leffler's refusal to answer whether or not uh, President-elect Biden won the election and whether or not she stands with uh, Trump's uh, uh, claims that this was a rigged vote. So I think in both senses, uh, both both campaigns can use these non-answers to go energize their core supporters. The question, I suppose, of who can get more fired up about something that's happened in the past and that's happening in the present or something that could potentially happen in the future uh, in terms of court packing. Greg Bluestein, thank you so much for joining us and for breaking all of that down. It's always great to have you. Coming up, more threats on public officials in Michigan. We're back with more on that in 90 seconds. Things in Michigan are getting very, very scary. As a reminder, President-elect Biden's victory was certified in Michigan last month. He won the state by more than 150,000 votes. And just a couple of hours ago, a federal judge rejected a Trump lawsuit to completely overturn the results because of, quote, widespread fraud, saying the allegations were based on nothing but speculation and conjecture. But now residents are trying to take matters into their own hands. Over the weekend, protesters posted a video to Facebook of an incident that can only be described as an extreme step to try and intimidate Secretary of State Jocelyn Benson. They marched to her house and passed a security car that was already posted on her block because of threats. They chanted legal votes only in front of her house with posters and megaphones. Benson says she and her four-year-old son had just finished decorating for Christmas and were about to sit down to watch a movie when the protesters, some of them armed, started shouting. According to a statement from the Michigan Attorney General and Wayne County Prosecutor, at least one individual could be heard shouting, you're murderers, within an earshot of her child's bedroom. Benson released a statement saying in part 
The demands made outside my home were unambiguous, loud, and threatening. They targeted me in, in my role as Michigan's chief election officer. But the threats of those gathered weren't actually aimed at me or any other elected officials in the state. They were aimed at the voters. Joining me now is Paul Egan. He covers the Michigan government for the Detroit Free Press. Paul, in your view, why is this happening? There is so much going on in Michigan that is very concerning. It seems to be happening just because attitudes over this election are so polarized. Um, there's a certain segment of the population that is not willing to accept the election result. We're having all kinds of litigation, not just brought by the Trump campaign, but by by, by uh, a variety of voters. And, and we're having, you know, not just incidents like this um, demonstration in front of the Secretary of State's home, but, um, you know, some vicious and in some case racist threats being made against uh, state lawmakers. Yeah, it seems to me that there is a very different, it's a very different thing to show up at an elected official's house and protest with a sign, then showing up with a gun, <laughs> uh, even in an open carry state. Should Democrats be concerned about their safety? I mean, what's the purpose of showing up? Unless it's a protest, you know, for gun, more expanding gun rights, why are you showing up with your open carry? I feel like that is threatening in and of itself, and Democrats should be concerned for their safety. There's certainly um, reason to be concerned. You know, this open carry business has been going on at the Capitol for years and years. And, uh, you know, I remember one day waiting outside the governor's office in the Capitol, the ceremonial office building when I I was fairly new to Michigan at the time and was surprised to turn around. There were two men standing there with rifles and clearly were police officers. Um, but it's, you know, to a certain extent, it's been just portrayed as part of the culture and and this is people exercising our second amendment rights i think where that's taken a big turn was in october in early october when we had federal and state officials bring charges of plotting to kidnap the governor uh, there are allegations in that case which involved wiretaps and infiltration by um undercover officers of, of this particular group that there were plans uh, by armed men to storm the capitol um, interestingly, even after all of that came to light, uh, the Michigan Capital Commission, which is controlled by uh, Republican appointees here in the Capitol, has still been unwilling to ban firearms, open carry or otherwise, inside the Capitol, where, you know, where state lawmakers actually look up at a gallery where there is uh, no, no bulletproof glass and where people are able to enter the Capitol without uh, any any um, uh, metal detectors or anything else. So certainly um, one can understand why why lawmakers would be concerned. That feels to me like just, you know, an, a, a disaster waiting to happen. They're sitting there, you know, while all this controversy is brewing in the state and there are absolutely no, there's no bulletproof, gra bulletproof glass or detectors and there are just people up in the seats with guns that could shoot the, these legislatures as they do their work. Not typically, but certainly there there have been days, notably one day when there was a huge demonstration at the Capitol, a number of uh, armed men uh, took seats in the Capitol, were looking down upon lawmakers. And this was after a, a, a demonstration where uh, certainly not a majority, but some of the people that were mm -hmm. demonstrating outside of the Capitol were carrying uh, you know, uh, signs that said uh, tyrants get the noose and, uh, um, you know, other very, um, very blatantly violent images that were being carried by at least some of these people. So, you know, certainly if I was a, a lawmaker, particularly, uh, let's say a black lawmaker from Detroit had to walk through that on the way into the Capitol, I certainly wouldn't feel comfortable uh, sitting in uh, my seat and looking up and, and seeing uh, men, uh, you know, large numbers of white armed men with, with guns, certainly not. It's very concerning. Thank you so much, Paul Ian, for being here and stay safe. Joining me now is Michigan Secretary of State, Jocelyn Benson. Thank you so much for being here uh, with all that is going on. How are you and your family doing? 
We are safe. We are good. We are under the protection of state and local law enforcement and our you know, vociferous attorney general who's been on guard since this all began. Uh, so we're doing fine. Thank you. And, you know, my focus is also on ensuring people know our democracy is safe and will prevail as well. What worries you most about these protests and threats? As I was speaking with Paul, um, you know, it really does seem alarming to me. I understand, you know, the Second Amendment and people want to express their their Second Amendment rights, but it feels like there needs to be a limit on that. If they're they're sending threatening messages to elected officials, then showing up with our, you know, guns to the Capitol and sitting just to watch, that feels menacing. Um, what worries you in terms of what could potentially happen um, if there are no changes and folks just keep showing up and you know keep uh, stoking this uh, obvious tension that exists in your state? Well, I think two things. I mean, one, we are in this historically divided moment where we do need all leaders from both sides of the aisle to recognize their importance of coming together and denouncing hateful rhetoric and hateful actions that have been, quite frankly, part of our discourse, unfortunately, in Michigan and nationwide for far too long, and now are bleeding over into this question over whether our democracy is is uh, and and should be and should remain sacred. Uh, I recognize, secondly, that for me. The threats against me and my family are targeted at me as a personification of the electorate, of the voters who spoke. In 5.5 million Michigan citizens participated in November's elections, and their choice was clear. And so if people are unhappy with that and they want to target that unhappiness at me as the representative of that system, that's fine because I know our democracy is strong, it will prevail, and I'm proud to defend the will of the voters, whatever it may be, uh, throughout my career and throughout my time as Secretary of State. But what is particularly notable, and this is also important for us to be aware of, is, is as this hateful rhetoric increases, the misinformation and false information is now causing people to doubt what they should have a lot of faith in, which is in the security and the accuracy of our elections. And that's where we need all elected officials to just stand down and ensure that the truth is known, that indeed the voice of the people has spoken and it will stand. I would think that, you know, in your view, Donald Trump may be the number one super spreader of misinformation uh, in this particular moment. Do you blame him um, in part for some of this uh, violent rhetoric and also the threatening actions by uh, some of his supporters? I think there are a number of political actors and individuals with platforms who have been knowingly spreading false information about this November election. It was the biggest threat to election security moving into this election cycle. And it's really been disappointing to see the way now we're a month after the polls close. Individuals, including the president, continue to sow misinformation and spread lies about our election process. And then it results in things like this. And, and so even as everything was occurring outside my home, I was really, I was both determined to you know, stand guard and protect the will of the voters. That was essentially what was under threat. But also it's just sad because to me, every citizen, regardless of how they voted, regardless of who they supported in this election, needs to know they can have faith in the security and the accuracy of the election results. And we need everyone to just recognize that's the, the reality. That's not going to change no matter how many false press conferences or, or uh, politically driven legislative hearings we have here in the state or elsewhere. The truth is going to remain. The election is clear and it's uh, been certified here in our state. So we're going to continue to just protect the process and ensure voters can have faith in that process. And I hope ultimately our lawmakers in the state of Michigan will join us on both sides of the aisle, as many have, in doing the same. Last question is, is essentially how do we rebuild the trust that's been lost in this moment? I mean, I feel like a lot of the misinformation we've been talking about and these claims of fraud by the president and his allies are, are leading to a level of distrust, at least in, in the Republican base, but hopefully not overall. How do we rebuild uh, some of that trust back up? Obviously, um, you standing up and saying, I am defending the rights of the voters goes a long way, but how else can we hopefully work to uh, rebuild this just distrust so that in future elections, people are not questioning whether or not it's going to be fair? I think with transparency, truth, and education. One of the things that gives me great hope, and I tell our election workers and, and clerks this all the time, is the truth is on our side. We ran a secure, accessible, transparent election and under immense scrutiny, uh, national scrutiny like we've never seen before. 
we're happy to stand up to that scrutiny because we have faith and belief in the accuracy of our results and in our work. And we believe that ultimately that's going to carry the day. Uh, but we need leaders, uh, again, even those who don't agree with the results or, or, or disagree with the way that the electorate voted, to recognize that reality as well. And then ultimately, once we and as we get through this moment, to really educate each other, listen to each other about how we can rebuild that trust together. Because more elections are coming in the future, and we want to ensure people people on both sides of the aisle, again, remain engaged and can rightly have that faith as they should have in the democratic process and in their vote. Absolutely. Jocelyn Benson, thank you very, very much for being here and please stay safe. Thank you. Coming up, we've known all along that communities of color are taking the brunt of the coronavirus pandemic, but it's even worse than we thought. Plus, Vaccine misinformation has been spreading almost as fast as the virus itself. We're taking a look at the role social media plays in ensuring confidence in the upcoming vaccines. But before we go, a reminder to check us out on Twitter. Follow us at Zerlina Show. We're back in 60 seconds. But when something like this happened uh, with the pandemic, where you have a disproportionate amount of blacks and Latinos dying, it's, it's not that big of a deal when we're dying by the, by the tens of thousands disproportionately. And so essentially, we have to make our communities, all Americans, a priority. And so one, we, we, we spoke into the, the different types of messaging. But, but again, it fundamentally say, it says, listen, we have to allocate resources, manpower, money, everything to, towards mitigating this. That was Dr. Bernard Ashby of the Com Committee to Protect Medicare talking about the huge racial disparities and deaths from COVID-19. The CDC came out with new figures last week that show the disparity in death rates is far higher than we knew. Black people and Latinos die nearly three times the rate of whites from the disease. The new CDC figures show us this. Also, black people are 3.7 times more likely than whites to be hospitalized, while Latinos are four times more likely to end up in the hospital. Joining us to discuss this is Dr. Joshua Sharfstein, Vice Dean for the Public Health Practice and Community Engagement at Johns Hopkins University, and Olivia Vera, a graduate student in public health at Johns Hopkins who is planning to go to medical school to become a doctor. Thank goodness we need more of you guys. Uh, Dr. Sharfstein, the CDC came up with these new figures after adjusting for age. Could you explain what that means and why it resulted in figures showing higher rates of death for black people and Latinos? Sure, thanks so much for uh, paying attention to this really important issue because for a long time, the CDC's figures were showing only a modest increase in death for African-Americans and Latinos. And the reason is they were just looking at how many people were dying, not taking into account that the white population is actually much older than the black and Latino population. And as a result, people were more likely to die who were white just because of their age. The normal way to compare uh, races and ethnicities for mortality is to actually standardize the age distribution so you can see what's actually the difference based on race and ethnicity. And finally, the CDC did that, which is great. And that number reveals a really shocking disparity. As you said, almost three times higher the rate of death among African-Americans and Latinos from COVID-19. It is unacceptable and it's going to require a lot of focused attention to make better. 
A lot of times, you know, part of uh, problem solving is first, um, as they did here, try to get the right data. So you need the right uh, factual data, um, and then you need to figure out why that data um, is the way it is. So why is it that Black and Latinos are dying um, at higher rates? Olivia, can you lay out for us why the death rate for Blacks and Latinos may be higher and why the hospitalization rates are so much higher for Black and Latinos due to COVID-19? Sure. So I think it's very tempting to assume that this is because of differences in biology or innate differences between racial groups. But the reality is that this disparity that we're seeing, um, and that has been newly quantified by the CDC, is a result of decades and a legacy of differences in resources and in the allocation of supports to communities of color, specifically Black, Indigenous, and Latino populations. And so when we're seeing disparities in mortality and in hospitalization, it's not because of a difference in biology. It's really because of a difference in the resources that's allocated to those people. That's a really, really important uh, foundational piece uh, in order to understand these numbers. Dr. Sharfstein, the pandemic seems to be highlighting uh, these racial disparities uh, and in health uh, that uh, she just uh, Uh, laid out for us. And as we know, they've existed for a very long time. What should our priorities be to end these disparities? Um, Is it increased access um, in, you know, vaccinations being prioritized for these communities? What are the options here? And what do you want to see the Biden administration do on this front? Uh, It's a great question. And Olivia is a fantastic student at Johns Hopkins. She explained that extremely well. I would say that to make progress here, we have to go right at some of the causes. And some of them are going to be um, easier to go at and others are gonna be more challenging and take more time, but it's very much worth uh, going after them because there's a lot of health benefits from undoing some of the inequities that are there in our society. So specifically um, around coronavirus, we need to make sure people have access to testing and care in their neighborhoods so that they are not um, uh, disproportionately under-tested and under-cared for coming to, to treatment too late. For some of the underlying reasons why people are exposed, we need protections for people at work, we need sick leave, we want to make sure that uh, people have access to decent housing and they're not evicted, right, uh, in a period where they have to go into a shelter and could be widely exposed. People need access to food. It's no surprise people are leaving home to get food if they don't have any at home. So there's a range of things, and I certainly think having a very serious, um, engaged campaign to help people understand and appreciate the benefits of vaccination and get vaccinated is going to be an important part, uh, right, really, in the next few months. Absolutely. Dr. Joshua Sharfstein and Olivia Vera, thank you so much for, for coming uh, on tonight. I hope to have you back. It was a great conversation. As we've been talking about for weeks now, there is light at the end of this very dark COVID tunnel. Vaccines are on the way. And today, Dr. Anthony Fauci gave an updated timeline on when things might start to go back to normal, if we all take the shot. If we do that well, by the time we get into the core of the summer and get to the end of the summer and into the start of the third quarter of 2021, we should be in good shape. While that's exciting news, we first need to convince Americans to take these vaccines when they're available. And that's not looking so easy right now. A new poll by National Geographic and Morning Consult shows that just 61% of Americans say they're likely to take a COVID-19 vaccine. Those numbers are going to need to go up a lot (laughs) if we want to slow the spread. And one huge problem is misinformation circling around the internet. Last week, Facebook said it's going to start to remove vaccine misinformation from its platform. But will that be enough? Joining me now is NBC News reporter Ben Collins, who has been following this story and so many others pertaining to Facebook. As I just said, Facebook has resisted taking down misinformation in the past. Why are they doing it now when it comes to the COVID-19 vaccine? So it's really not, I don't know if you remember this, but nine months ago, which feels like 300 years ago now, uh, you know, COVID was not really that much of a political thing. And that's when Mark Zuckerberg said, hey, you know, this isn't a political thing. We're not going to get into a fight with the president over this. We can just take down anti-vax content. We can just take down uh, coronavirus trutherism content, right? Uh, So that was nine months ago. Things have changed since then. Uh, The president has made it a very political thing. 
Uh, and his supporters have made it a very political thing. Uh, some of his supporters are deeply in the weeds on coronavirus vaccine uh, conspiracy theories, saying it's microchips and all this other nonsense that's straight up not true. Um, but back then, it wasn't that big of a deal. They've had this policy for nine months. Now they're going to implement it even more so than usual. And they've actually added on more protections against anti-vax content, uh, content since then. So, um, you know, they are kind of stepping up here, but they stepped up before it became sort of a debate. One of the things that I don't understand about the, the microchip thing, people on Facebook, people give all of their information to Facebook. So I just want to re yep. remind people that you give all of your information to Facebook. And so those same people that are on Facebook and Facebook knows everything about them are concerned and, you know, trafficking co in conspiracy theories about being microchipped so they can be tracked by the government when all of their information is on the platform they're currently reading that conspiracy theory on. Yeah, a lot of people worried about becoming sheep who are already sheep on Facebook. That's really what's happening here. Uh, look, logical consistency is not the point of conspiracy theories. It's to get people scared so people can sell you stuff. So uh, look, Serlina, you're ex exactly right. Uh, if somebody's massive mind control operation involving involved microchips, I think they would have just skipped that step at this point. They already, uh, you know, you can just do it through Facebook pretty easily. I mean, anybody who's watched The Social Dilemma uh, is probably thinking a lot about the fact that, like, these companies already got you. <laughs> they don't need a microchip. Okay, going back to the vaccine uh, polling that we were talking about earlier, there's a gender divide, which is weird. It surprised me, at least. Only 51% of women say they're likely to take the vaccine as opposed to 69% of men. That shocked me. Have you seen any signs that some of this misinformation on Facebook is specifically targeting women? Look, I can't tell you for... Uh, like a definitive fact that it has to do with Facebook disinformation, but I can tell you that anti-vax coronavirus uh, misinformation specifically targets communities that overlap with women's interests. For example, uh, wellness groups, healing groups, religious groups, PTA groups, um, pet groups. Those are ones that are being specifically targeted by anti-vaxxers. Uh, there are coordinated campaigns by people, by anti-vax people, who are, by the way, trying to sell you stuff like water filters to go into those groups and say, hey, we can get more people on our side if we use this sort of narrow opening and expand it to coronavirus vaccine stuff. So we've seen lots of that. Look, researchers at George Washington University last week told my colleague, Brand colleague Brandy Zdrozny, that it's like tumor growth. That's what this is like on Facebook right now, coronavirus uh, uh, misinformation. So it's really scary. We've got to get this wrapped up in the next few months. What is the radiation treatment for that? I mean, I don't know what we do, but it seems to me that Just, uh, if they're trafficking the in river, pet man. groups, yeah. then we have a problem. <laughs> yeah, yeah no, we're, we we're have in a problem. Let's get ben Collins, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Uh, thank you so much for being here and for breaking all of that down. That does it for me tonight. I'm Zerlina Maxwell. The Mehdi Hassan Show is coming up after a short break right here on Peacock.
Donald Trump is on his way out in 44 days. A look at what he faces on the other side from the prosecutor who deposed Ivanka Trump. Attorney General Carl Racine of DC joins us. Plus, how many times can the president lose the election in Georgia? We're now up to three times and counting. The Peach State becomes the new ground zero for election disinformation, with the fate of the Senate only weeks away. Also, as coronavirus sets new records daily in the US, should anyone still be looking to Sweden as a model for fighting COVID? Even the Swedes? Good evening, I'm Mehdi Hassan. In the United States, it's generally accepted that no one is above the law, whether that be the average civilian on the street or our top lawmakers. At least that's what we're told is supposed to be the way it works. But what if a sitting president commits a crime? That's when things get a little murky. You see, back in 1973, in the middle of Nixon's Watergate scandal, the DOJ's Office of Legal Counsel, the OLC, issued a memo stating a sitting president cannot be indicted because it would interfere with the president's unique official duties, most of which cannot be performed by anyone else. Nixon, by the way, ended up resigning about a year later and getting preemptively pardoned for all and any crimes. In the year 2000, the OLC reaffirmed its position, saying that indicting a sitting president would undermine the capacity of the executive branch to perform its constitutionally assigned functions. That opinion is believed to be what protected Trump from criminal charges in special counsel Robert Mueller's Russia investigation. But come January 20th, that won't apply to Trump anymore. And there's already a litany of legal battles waiting for him once he's out of office, most notably in his original home state of New York. The Manhattan DA is seeking years of Trump's tax returns as part of its criminal investigation into the Trump Organization, which started out as a probe into payments reportedly made by Trump to cover up alleged extramarital affairs. And while the DA has been tight-lipped about the scope of his probe, prosecutors from his office revealed in September that they might be eyeing tax and bank fraud charges. Some argue Trump should face criminal charges for obstruction of justice in the Mueller probe and also for his administration's mishandling of the coronavirus pandemic, though no one has brought such a case yet. Trump's also facing a number of civil cases. New York Attorney General Letitia James is looking into whether Trump improperly inflated and deflated the value of his assets, depending on whether he needed bank loans or tax breaks. He also faces separate defamation suits from E. Jean Carroll and Summer Zervos, both have accused Trump of sexual assault. In all these cases, Trump has denied any wrongdoing. And finally, there's the question of whether the president profited from his time in public office. Last week, White House senior advisor and first daughter Ivanka Trump was deposed in one such case. The DC attorney general is suing Trump's inaugural committee for allegedly grossly overpaying for event space at Trump's DC hotel to the tune of a million dollars. After the deposition, Ivanka Trump called the case politically motivated and a waste of taxpayer dollars. Joining me now is the Attorney General for Washington, D.C., Carl Racine, who's also working on a new plan to combat hate crimes. Uh, Attorney General, thank you so much for joining us on the show. Uh, let me ask, uh, let me start by asking you this. Ivanka Trump says you're being vindictive and wasting taxpayers' money. What's your response to her? Well, I think that Ivanka Trump's uh, allegation is completely erroneous, incorrect, and typical of the Trump defense which is always someone else's fault, and it's partisan. The fact is that Democratic attorney generals like myself have brought a lot of suits against the Trumps. The proof is in the pudding. We've won 80% of the lawsuits that we brought. The judges who have ruled in our favor yeah. have been appointed by both Democrat and Republican presidents. The case I'm bringing is a valid case, and we'll prove it in court. Ivanka Trump has also said she provided an email in which she said the Trump Hotel should charge, quote, a fair market rate. But you say that st statement from her was just misleading. How so? Ordinarily, I would not be out here talking about a pending case and going back and forth with a witness. However, when a witness misleads and frankly tells untruths, it's my responsibility to clear it up. The email that Ivanka Trump is referring to 
is an email that actually shows that she was in the decision making loop. There is no email nor no testimony that establishes that Ms. Trump ever was outraged at the hundreds of thousands of dollars of waste. Let me give you an example. In one instance, the yeah. Trump uh, inaugural committee was charged $175,000 for event space that another not-for-profit was charged $5,000. There is no email nor testimony that Ms. Trump objected to that at all. Again, we're going to try this in the courts yeah. and the, the judge will decide. And I'm confident about our case. I think that's what's worrying her, hence all the tweets. Uh, there's been reporting, Attorney General, that Trump is considering preemptive pardons for his kids, for people in his orbit, maybe even for himself. How would that affect your case in D.C.? Marty, as you, as you have well said, our case is a civil case. And President Trump's pardon authority only extends to federal criminal cases. So our civil case will go on. And it's a fair question. Why are we suing and what is the relief that we're seeking? Well, we're seeking repayment of all those monies that should not have gone into the pocket of the Trumps via the Trump Hotel. And we'd like to shut any and all existing life out of that inauguration committee. The same result that the New York Attorney General got when she successfully sued the Trump Foundation two years ago. Yes. Yes, the Trump Foundation, he paid a fine, the Trump University, so-called, uh, he had to settle. Um, President-elect Joe Biden has said he will neither direct nor interfere with any future D uh, DOJ probe against Trump, though NBC News has been reporting that he really just, the president-elect really just wants to move on. Do you think it's a mistake? You're a lawyer, you're a prosecutor. Do you think it's a mistake not to hold Trump and his family legally accountable once they're out of office? I think it's a very challenging and difficult decision for a new administration to make. And I think they have to be very thoughtful and deliberate. The fact is that we want to hold everyone accountable to the law. As you indicated at the outset, there's one rule of law and no one is above it. At the same time, we want to move forward uh, as a country and not fight old skirmishes and wars. I believe that Joe Biden, his future attorney general and that team will exercise the appropriate balance and judgment. And again, the state attorneys general the city DAs, like the Manhattan DAs, will do what they believe the evidence yeah. requires. Maybe they bring the criminal suits. Indeed, maybe. Uh, you've recently unveiled an initiative to counter hate crimes, including raising awareness, uh, supporting victims, and improving data. That data shows hate crimes are on the rise in America. The FBI annual report, for example, found over 7,300 incidents in 2019, a 10-year high. That includes a record high 51 murders. I have to ask, Attorney General, this has happened on Donald Trump's watch. The rhetoric from the president and people around him is pretty hate-filled. Do you think that's contributed to this rise in hate crimes that we're seeing? I think there's no doubt about it. Uh, the tenor, the mood, the tolerance for violence, for hate speech, uh, for division has accelerated at an extraordinary pace. And I watched your show when you had the fabulous Christian uh, Piccolini on a few weeks ago. And what Christian said, who was an expert in breaking hate, is that the hate that has been sowed yeah. is going to reveal itself in future years. That's why the initiative that I'm leading is so important to get 56 state attorney generals, Democrats and Republicans, to stand in one voice and not tolerate hateful division and debasement and dehumanization of people based on their physical and other characteristics. Well, I'm glad to hear you're doing that, Attorney General. I'm also glad to hear you're watching the show, I should add. Uh, one last question before I let you go. Uh, the U.S. does have a very broad uh, First Amendment free speech right, even in regards to threats and violent speech. As a prosecutor, I wonder, do you wish it were easier to prosecute people in this country for inciting violence, especially against minorities, against immigrants, against vulnerable communities? Well, I think you said it right. Our First Amendment is robust. Our protection in regards to publication is also important. But let's not get carried away and realize what the First Amendment protects against. It protects against 
government restricting speech. I think that big platforms, social media companies can do a lot more in regards to getting hate off of their platforms. We're starting to see them move that way, not fast enough. That also will be part of my initiative to use the bully pulpit and get better, more responsible conduct yeah. from those platforms. And just on that incitement, you have a story out of Michigan today where the Secretary of State, Jocelyn Benson, who's been on this show a few times, had armed men outside her house shouting threats at her last night. Uh, I mean, number one, how do you tackle that? And number two, do you worry about your own safety as an elected uh, Democratic Party official, uh, well, elected Attorney General from the Democratic Party, a person of color yourself? I wonder in the current climate, how worried are you? You know, to be very honest with you, uh, I'm a person of faith. Uh, and ultimately, you know, I feel protected uh, by the God I pray to. And I hope to God that people who disagree with me can disagree vehemently, but not in a criminal manner. Um, with respect to what occurred to Michigan, this is why responsible leaders must watch their words. You've got reckless, violent chatter inspiring people who, frankly, don't need any inspiration at all. Indeed. Indeed, but I don't know how many people on one side of the aisle are listening to that right now, sadly. Uh, D.C. Attorney General Carl Racine, thank you so much for your time. We appreciate it. Over the weekend, Donald Trump traveled to Georgia with the plan uh, of stumping for Republican Senators David Perdue and Kelly Leffler in their upcoming runoff elections. But of course, from the start, Donald Trump couldn't help making it all about Donald Trump. And I want to say, hello, Georgia. We did a great job. You know, we won Georgia, just so you understand. Actually, as of today, he has lost Georgia three times. Uh, Republican Secretary of State Brad Raffensperger again certified Joe Biden's victory this morning. We have now counted legally cast ballots three times and the results remain unchanged. For a guy who doesn't like to be called a loser, he's certainly giving us a lot of opportunities to do so. Also in Georgia on Monday, the fabled Kraken court case that was supposed to prove massive fraud in the election was dismissed by Judge Timothy Batten, a George W. Bush Republican appointee. They want this court to substitute its judgment for the 2.5 million voters who voted for Biden, Batten wrote. This I'm unwilling to do. He added that allowing the case to stand would have been an act of, quote, judicial activism. Meanwhile, the Georgia runoff candidates participated in debates over the weekend. Well, three out of four of them did anyway. David Perdue, whose 2,600 stock trades in one Senate term have gotten the attention of the Justice Department, skipped his debate, leaving an empty podium next to Democrat John Ossoff. In the other debate, GOP Senator Kelly Leffler spent most of her time calling Democratic opponent Raphael Warnock a radical and refusing to acknowledge the presidential election was over. Yes or no, Senator Leffler, did Donald Trump lose the presidential election? You know, President Trump has every right to use every legal recourse available. And this process is still playing out, and President Trump has every right to every legal recourse. Well, the president has the right to pursue every legal recourse to make sure that this was a free and fair election in Georgia. Pollsters are starting to handicap the two Senate races. They show the Democrats leading slightly. But if we've learned anything in the past four years, it's to put polls out of our minds before we go, well, out of our minds. The election is forcing the GOP to thread a tiny needle, showing support for Trump, but also arguing you have to vote for the Republican senators to prevent Democrats from taking control of Washington under a President Biden. The president was also clear that Georgians need to come out and vote for David Perdue and myself because of what's at stake in this election. You know, Chuck Schumer said, now we take Georgia, then we change America. We all know what that change would be. Wait, how does that work? Trump says the Democrats will take control if they win these Senate seats. If the other side manages to steal both elections, 
We will have total one-party socialist control, and everything you care about will be gone. Your whole philosophy is going to be gone. Joe Biden, Kamala, Kamala Harris. Crying Chuck Schumer and Nancy Pelosi. Notice the extra booing from the crowd there at the mention of the black woman's name. It's so weird, by the way, how all these Republicans deny Trump lost, then suggest you have to vote for Republican senators because Trump lost. Speaking of denial, Trump's longtime personal lawyer, Rudy Giuliani, checked into the hospital in Washington on Sunday after testing positive for COVID-19, joining the long list of Republican elites who have contracted the virus after spurning masks, social distancing, and basic common sense. Giuliani also was just in Georgia last Thursday, arguing Trump's election case before a state Senate subcommittee without evidence and without a mask. As we all recall, he did the same in Michigan the day before. Would you be comfortable taking your mask off so that people could hear you more clearly? Can, can you hear me now? Can everyone hear it clearly? We can hear it, folks. We can, we can hear you. Okay. Now, Atlanta is in disarray. Uh, Senate Republicans cancelling a barbecue fundraiser Monday, quote, due to a large group of senators being exposed to COVID-19 via Rudy Giuliani. And Senate staffers who were in a hearing room with Giuliani are now being told to work from home and get tested for the virus. Exactly how many ways can one party find to deny reality, to endanger Americans, to undermine democracy, and to hobble the work of our public officials. Joining us now is Georgia State Senator Jen Jordan, who was in that hearing room for Giuliani's performance. Uh, thank you so much for joining us on the show. Let me ask you first, have you and your staff been tested? Uh, what's your reaction to this news that Rudy Giuliani has COVID? So we found out yesterday um, after the president tweeted it out. Um, and we've talked to public health officials. We're supposed to get tested tomorrow. Day five after um, being exposed is supposed to be kind of a sweet spot in terms of getting tested to, to determine if you have it or not. But, um, you know, it, it's, it's incredibly disappointing. Indeed, disappointing indeed. It's so uh, dangerous and reckless. As for Rudy Giuliani's actual testimony in front of your committee, uh, did he have any evidence of anything apart from COVID inside of him? Look, the issue with their presentation last week was that um, it was coordinated with Senate Republicans. Democrats weren't told anything. We had no clue uh, that Mr. Giuliani was going to come down or any other member of Trump's legal team. Um, we literally hear cheers in the hall um, from protesters that were there um, with Stop the Steal. Um, and that's how we were notified, basically, that Giuliani was there. And then they roll in, um, they present a case almost as if it were in court. They had witnesses that they that they questioned. Um, and of course, we had no idea who was going to show up, what they were going to say or what the evidence was. And the whole point was really just to kind of have OAN live stream this um, and have Trump supporters watch it without any real way to refute what they were saying. But we did what we could do that day. Indeed. And it's all been a bit of a circus, unfortunately, in your state, prompted by these Republican antics. Uh, Secretary of State Raffensperger has certified the election results and the so-called Kraken case from Sidney Powell has been thrown out in Georgia. The election is over. Even Trump and Leffler and last week Purdue have made comments uh, that suggest they understand the election is over but are pretending it's not. What are you hearing from your Republican colleagues in Georgia in private? So in private, people just want it to go away. Um, I think that they feel pressure not to say anything or not to actually uh, just acknowledge reality. And the problem with that is that elected officials, leaders, when they're not saying things, um, then it just kind of lets this, this kind of uh, narrative, this conspiracy-driven narrative that somehow the election was stolen or something untoward happened, it just grows and grows and it definitely gets oxygen. Um, finally, the governor came out and the attorney general in Georgia um, came out and said, look, Joe Biden won, Trump lost. Um, but, yeah. you know, it's almost a, too little too late at this point. 
Indeed, indeed. Last night, uh, with a Senate runoff debate, David Perdue didn't turn up to debate John Ossoff. Kelly Leffler did. She did show. Uh, but Raphael Warnock, your party's candidate, he was kind of soft on it. He didn't really land any blows, did he, in terms of the open goals she gave him on corruption, on Trump's election, etc., etc. Look, I think what Reverend Warnock is trying to do is, is run a campaign that's really fueled by um, issues and talking about issues and trying not to go um, negative constantly. I mean, that's literally all that, that Kelly Leffler has. And so, you know, you heard her say it again and again, and she basically just repeated herself, but they were really just negative talking yes. points. I think, I think Reverend Warnock is trying to offer something else to the people of Georgia. And to be quite frank, I think that's what they want. Yeah, uh, it is perhaps what they want, but uh, some of us also want to see Kelly Leffler held to account. Uh, one of the reasons Joe Biden won Georgia was not just a strong black turnout there, but also white suburban women who used to vote GOP switching away from Trump. With Trump not on the ballot in January, does that make your party's task in Georgia, Georgia much harder? These white women don't show up or go back to Leffler and Purdue? Look, I think everybody in this state realizes what's on the line because at the end of the day, the people who voted for Joe Biden voted for change. They voted um, for someone to come in and actually be able to do the work that needs to be done, whether it's with the virus, um, the economy, whatever it is, they want change. And they know at the end of the day that if John Ossoff and Reverend Warnock aren't elected, that that's not gonna be possible because you're gonna have McConnell time after time just trying to Indeed. obstruct any kind of progress. And I just wanted to ask you this. We're hearing a lot uh, outside of Georgia about, you know, people in Georgia, Republicans in Georgia, Trump supporters are saying, we're not going to vote. You, we saw the videos. We played them on this show last week from Linwood and Sidney Powell, these Trump supporting lawyers saying, don't vote in the Senate race. It's all rigged. The votes go to China and all this other nonsense. Is that a real phenomenon or is it just a few people telling reporters we're not going to vote? But actually, most Republicans in Georgia will vote down the line loyally for Purdue and Leffler. Look, I think it's a real issue for them. I think that's where they're really having a hard time in terms of threading the needle because you're you're kind of buying in or you're selling what Trump is selling in terms of that he won the election and their votes were stolen. But at the same time, you're gonna tell them to come back out in January because you really need their votes. Um, yeah. Folks have a real issue in terms of uh, the machines or or thinking that this is gonna that their vote's gonna matter. And so Republicans ha are really suppressing their own vote just because of the message that they're putting out there in support of Donald Trump. Yeah, indeed. I love the idea that Republicans in Georgia have become so good at voter suppression that they're now, in your words, suppressing their own vote too. Uh, State Senator Jen Jordan, we'll have to leave it there. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much. I want to flag a one other horrendous moment, a horrendous moment that, like so often is the case, was overlooked from Trump's speech in Georgia on Saturday. Chuck Schumer said rather infamously, first we take Georgia, then we take America. But they don't mean take America like in a good sense. They mean bring it over to things that the people of Georgia don't want. You're not going to like it when they want to take over your farm. Gee, we own this farm too. You know, we were here also. We own this farm. It's an odd thing to say, you might think. Who's coming for whose farms exactly? Josh Marshall of TPM pointed out that this seems to be a pretty shocking reference to a racist conspiracy theory popular among white nationalists and neo-Nazis for years and that was seemingly first introduced to the president in August 2018 by who else? Fox News host Tucker Carlson. The AP reported at the time that Carlson argued against a proposal that would allow the South African government to seize some white-owned agricultural land, part of an effort to address inequities left over from apartheid. Whites own more than 70% of such farmland, despite being about 8% of the population in that country. It was soon after that the president called on Secretary of State Mike Pompeo to investigate it. Here's the thing. No one is coming for the farms of Georgia's farmers, least of all black Georgians. The president knows this. And the agriculture secretary, Sonny Perdue, who used to be governor of Georgia, knows it too. What's endangering Georgia's farms 
is the president's tariff war with China, which has threatened crops like pecans and cotton. But after all the lies, all the fear-mongering, all the white nationalist talking points, this January, Trump will finally reap what he has sown. When we come back, Politico reports Joe Biden has made his pick for Secretary of Defense. Retired General Lloyd Austin will discuss that and will talk about the forgotten war. The US has been bombing the hell out of Afghanistan and no one seems to care. I would bomb the sh out of them. I would just bomb those suckers. And that's right, I'd blow up the pipes, I'd blow up the refi, I'd blow up every single inch, there would be nothing left. And you know what? You'll get Exxon to come in there in two months. You ever see these guys, how good they are, the great oil companies? They'll rebuild that sucker brand new, it'll be beautiful, and I'd ring it, and I'd take the oil. That was President, then candidate, Trump's strategy for taking out America's enemies back in 2015. ISIS is still a player in the region, so despite all the bombing, he never achieved that goal. But at least he was honest about his intentions, taking the oil. And to be fair to Trump, bombing the stuff out of people is a promise he's managed to keep. There's been a disturbing rise in civilian casualties in Afghanistan since the Trump administration lifted certain restrictions on coalition airstrikes. A report out of Brown University today found in just 2019 alone, US coalition and Afghan Air Force airstrikes killed 700 civilians. That's more than any year since 2001 when the war began. That's a 330% increase in civilian deaths from 2016. In fact, the report suggests the Afghan military is ramping up attacks on their own civilians to later use as a bargaining chip in negotiations, as the US kind of did before the Taliban talks. On Friday, I talked about Obama's drone strikes, Barack Obama's drone strikes, the bloodshed they caused, and his recent apologetics trying to rationalize them post-mortem. And yet there's this annoying narrative that Trump is somehow less hawkish, has less blood on his hands overseas than Obama did. And that's just not the case. Often when Trump pretends to end a war, it's not exactly as advertised. We learned last week, for example, President Trump had ordered troops out of Somalia and Senator Rand Paul thanked him for bringing those soldiers home. Except, reality check, they're not coming home. Many of them will be redeployed into Kenya, which, as Donald Trump and Republicans reminded us time and again in 2008, is very much not part of the US. Trump did the same in Syria. Lots of noise about pulling out troops last year, only to move them to Iraq and then send more US troops back into Syria this September. But really, there's a rather cynical method to this madness. There is. A White House official told CNN the goal was to set so many fires abroad it'll be hard for the Biden administration to put them out come January. But how much blood is the Trump administration spilling along the way? And are Americans even paying attention? I'm joined now by Nita Crawford. She's a professor and the chair of the political science department at Boston University and author of today's Brown University report on civilian casualties. And I'm also joined by Stephen Miles, executive director for Win Without War, a progressive activist group. Thank you both for joining me on the show. Nita, let me start with you. You found that the US and allied forces killed more civilians in Afghanistan last year than any other year in this 19-year war, and largely because restrictions on carrying out those strikes were loosened. 2019 was also the year that we killed more civilians than the Taliban. That will come as a shock to a lot of Americans, to a lot of our viewers. Did those numbers surprise you? 
Well, no, because they've been gradually ratcheting up. And in 2017, when the United States decided that it would loosen the rules of engagement, what happened was uh, the number of strikes went up and the amount of ordnance went up, 2017, 2018, 2019. And all of this is in the run-up toward the negotiations that the United States wanted to conclude with the Taliban. So it's no surprise to me that by 2019, the number of civilians killed was uh, greatly increased. Yeah. And what kind of restrictions were lifted, Nita? You mentioned the rules of engagement. How did it become easier to bomb people? Well, from 2008, 9, 10, the United States realized in that period that when it killed civilians, it was actually increasing resistance among the Afghan civilians. They weren't making friends. Yeah. They were making enemies. And they restricted the airstrikes so that you couldn't uh, bomb unless, for instance, U.S. troops were at risk or unless they had uh, a line of sight or or um, the target was clearly identified. And in 2017, when Mattis said that they were lifting the rules of engagement, loosening them, he meant that uh, you didn't necessarily have to uh, have such tight restrictions, that U.S. forces did not have to be at risk, for example. And then that allows a greater number yeah. of strikes and more ordnance. Yeah. So let me bring in Stephen. One thing that gets lost in these conversations is perspective. It's a lot of numbers of dead and numbers of strikes and stats. Uh, you, Stephen, at the start of the year, you tweeted that the US dropped 7,423 bombs in Afghanistan, and you actually used 7,423 bomb emojis to show us what that looks like. I mean, is that part of why we don't see public outrage over the deaths the US and its allies are causing abroad? We're just too detached from it all. It's all just a bunch of numbers. Yeah, I think we have lost a lot of perspective. I think it is very, very difficult to remember that we are at war in countries that we have been at war in for a very long time. And our media, for a large part, has done a terrible job of helping remind us of the consequences of that. That aside, the American public's actually been against these wars for a very long time. You know, Donald Trump, the reason he talks incessantly about how he's ending these wars, the reason that we've seen candidate after candidate running on a platform of ending these wars is because they remain unpopular. The problem is that the consequences are largely out of view from the American public. But the reality, uh, as, as Nita was just saying, is they're not out of view, obviously, of the people on the receiving end of these bombs. The reality of these, of, of these wars are deadly. They have devastating consequences. And they've been an abject failure. Yeah. Indeed, an abject failure. And, and Nita, you highlight an interesting moment in the report. Uh, General Stanley McChrystal, in his memoir, writes that following a 2007 NATO airstrike that killed half a dozen Afghan civilians, he told his team, uh, what is it we don't understand? We're going to lose this war if we don't stop killing civilians. Is that why we've effectively lost this 19-year-old war? Because we can't, we won't stop killing civilians. Well, the, the reasons for the stalemate and the increased um, capacity of the Taliban and ISIS is multiple. Um, for one thing, the uh, U.S. and the Afghan government are killing many civilians. The Afghan military and police, which are largely trained by the U.S. and our allies, aren't doing a great job either. So the Afghan government doesn't look credible. In addition, uh, the Afghan government has not been able to provide services to people in Afghanistan. And when they don't provide services, but the Taliban does, then people say, OK, yes. fine, we're with them. Yeah. No, it makes sense. And that's the problem. And it's been going on for so long. Stephen, as Nita's report showed, the Trump administration's relaxation of the rules of engagement coincided with a 95% increase in civilians killed by the US and allied forces. How is it, Stephen, that Trump is still seen by many on the right and even some on the left as some sort of anti-interventionist dove, someone who's against US militarism? You've written, quote, he's not some hero for ending wars. He's not, and the irony is he's not even ending those wars. 
Yeah, look, I mean, I think Donald Trump is a con man. We, we know this about Donald Trump. Being surprised by the fact that Donald Trump is doing one thing and saying another, at this point, it, no one should be surprised by that. The reality is in every theater of combat that he inherited, he poured gasoline on the fire. And now that he's some in some of those places le pouring less gasoline on the fire, he somehow wants credit for putting the fire out. It is absurd that Donald Trump is trying to pretend that he is an anti-war candidate, that he's some sort of anti-war hero. We have to separate that from the question of whether or not continuing to try to win wars that cannot be won on the battlefield but is, is a mistake. It is not a mistake to bring troops home from these wars. It is not a mistake to bring troops off of a battlefield that there is no military solution for. That's a good thing. But we ought to be clear exactly as you said, Donald Trump isn't ending these wars. He's not doing that. He's bringing some troops home. And in most cases, he's not even bringing them home. He's repositioning them to other countries. It's not entirely clear, for instance, in Somalia, that we'll be doing anything differently than what we've been doing. We'll just be bombing perhaps from other countries as we've been doing for years from Djibouti. Uh, it may be off, off, you know, kind of off, yeah. off the coast from Kenya. So we really, we really need to stop this farce. And 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 in terms of changing things, whether things change, obviously there's a change of president coming up. You wrote in a 2017 tweet, uh, you're going to see a lot of folks denouncing Trump, but basically calling for the same military first policy. Uh, fast forward to 2021, we're going to have a Biden presidency. Uh, Politico is reporting today that Biden intends to appoint retired General Lloyd Austin as his uh, defense secretary, as his Pentagon chief, with Tony Blinken, another man with a great interventionist record, as his secretary of state. Do you worry that we're going to see a continuation of that military first approach? It's, it's always a little alarming to see a tweet from 2017 and, and be reminded that it's still prescient today. I do think, look, I think anyone who's paid attention to the last several decades of U.S. foreign policy has to be concerned that we haven't learned the fundamental lesson that we cannot bomb our way to peace. We have been bombing and at war in Afghanistan and Iraq for decades now, in Somalia for decades now. We've been bombing and at war in Yemen for decades now. It has not worked. The folks who are being named to these cabinet positions so far, and I should say the jury's still out, but so far we are seeing folks who've been there for a long time, right? We shouldn't be surprised that folks close to Biden, that Biden is picking folks close to him. He's staffing his administration. The question's going to be, what lessons have they learned? What lessons have they taken away from the failures of the last several decades? What lessons have they taken away about the limits of US military power? What lessons have they taken away about just the, what is so horribly wrong about trying to win wars that cannot be won on the battlefield? Have they learned those lessons? Are they looking for change? I think that's gonna be the question before us. And if I might and does the fact, Stephen, that a general is back in charge of the Pentagon... Uh, Nita, I'll bring you in one moment. I just want to get Stephen's take specifically on Lloyd Austin. I know you're someone who's uh, lobbied and, you know, has, has campaigned uh, with the Democratic Party on progressive foreign policy. Does it bother you that a general's being, in charge of the, being put in charge of the Pentagon again, as with Jim Mattis under Trump, no civilian control of the Pentagon again? Yeah, I mean, look, we raised this objection under Donald Trump when he appointed Jim Mattis, as you said. We are alarmed by the, we, we are concerned about the possibility of another general being required to be given a waiver. You know, there's a law here for a reason. I think it's going to be beholden if he is, in fact, the nominee for him to address that concern throughout his nomination process, for him to answer questions. You know, okay. he was obviously a com commander of CENTCOM in charge of these wars. That doesn't tell us okay. what his positions are. In the positions where he'd be a civilian leader, what are his positions? We're going to have to find out. Indeed. And Nita, one last question to you. A few years ago, I interviewed retired Brigadier General Mark Kimmett, a former coalition spokesman in Iraq. And when I asked him about civilian deaths in Iraq, he told me we got out of the body count business years ago. Isn't that part of the problem that the government isn't keeping track of civilians that they kill? Shouldn't they be doing what you're doing, Nita? Actually, they do keep count of the civilians that they kill, but they have a different way of accounting. The United Nations does a much better job of accounting for civilian deaths in Afghanistan. And uh, they've been doing it quite well since 2008. And they show a higher number of civilians killed and injured. But if I might, let's go back to the question of, of a chance yeah. that we might have here. Briefly, because we're almost out of time. We've got 20 right, seconds to, left. To, go for it. To reform the U.S. foreign policy, because the United States is much less dependent on Persian Gulf oil, we could gr greatly reduce the military presence in the Middle East. And that seems to, to me to be a high priority. They could rethink 
instead of going back to legacy forces and legacy policies. Uh, it's a very good point, and I hope they do, and I hope this new administration listens to people like yourself and Stephen Miles. We appreciate you both taking time out to come on the show. Thank you so much. When we come back, even Sweden doesn't think herd immunity is a good idea anymore. So why do so many Americans still, conservative Americans, back after this? death rate is essentially worse than Sweden, equivalent to the less developed world that is unable to do any of the things that you've been promoting. Do you have any second thoughts? Are you willing to look at the data that countries that did very little actually have a lower death rate than the United States? As the death toll from COVID mounts, conservatives in America haven't just rejected the science and rejected lockdowns or social distancing or masks. They've said there's a better way, an alternative to all of this. What about Sweden, they say? Why can't we be like the Swedes? As lockdowns spread across the world, one country stood apart from the rest, Sweden. Well, it's instructive to check in on Sweden. Unlike almost every other Western nation, Sweden steadfastly refused to lock down. The prime minister doesn't have to, doesn't have to say in Sweden, stay in your house. The people stay there automatically. Encouraging individual responsibility. Suddenly we were told that Sweden was in fact a corpse-strewn hellhole. Anders Tegnell, Sweden's state epidemiologist, basically their Anthony Fauci, who in policy has been more like their Scott Atlas, said in April that they could reach herd immunity in Stockholm within a matter of weeks. The same dangerous nonsense that Dr. Atlas, until recently a top COVID advisor to Donald Trump, has been preaching here in the US. The Swedes, in essence, relied on self-responsibility against the coronavirus, trusting citizens to practice social distancing, to use common sense, and to self-isolate only if necessary, all without closures and all without masks. And it didn't work. The Wall Street Journal reported on Sunday, quote, Sweden's COVID-19 experiment is over. After a late autumn surge in infections led to rising hospitalizations and deaths, the government has abandoned its attempt, unique among Western nations, to combat the pandemic through voluntary measures. Like other Europeans, Swedes are now heading into the winter, facing restrictions ranging from a ban on large gatherings to curbs on alcohol sales and school closures, all aimed at preventing the country's health system from being swamped by patients and capping what is already among the highest per capita death tolls in the world. Look, it's been clear for a while now to some of us that Sweden wasn't any kind of COVID role model. I mentioned death per capita a moment ago. Just compare the Swedes to their own Nordic neighbors who did lock down and took a much tougher stance on preventing the spread of the virus. As of May 10th, Sweden had about 31 deaths per 100,000 versus Denmark with nine and Norway with four. The US had 24 per 100,000. That was Bloomberg reporting seven months ago. To be fair, Tegnell, the Swedish Fauci, kind of admitted over the summer that they'd got it wrong and too many people had died there. They're still dying. Take a look at the Nordic country's death tolls over the course of 2020, from the beginning of the crisis to the current day. One country stands out. Herd immunity, which the Swedes tried and which right-wingers in the US, like Scott Atlas, like Senator Rand Paul and others, are still so keen on, 
has been a complete and utter disaster. And it didn't even benefit Sweden's economy, as some were suggesting at the outset of the crisis. The economy is much worse than even the official data suggests. As one top economist told the New York Times in October, they literally gain nothing. It's a self-inflicted wound and they have no economic gains. And look, I get it. For right-wingers in America, a fair-skinned, blonde-haired, blue-eyed Nordic country seemed like a much better model than an Asian country like South Korea or Japan or Vietnam. South Korea, which didn't lock down, but did do mass testing and tracing, less than 600 deaths. Japan, which didn't lock down, but did do mass masking, less than 2,300 deaths. Vietnam locked down early, locked down hard, 35 deaths. Yes, just 35 total. The Swedes are now belatedly locking down, like most of their European neighbours. In France, for example, there's a second national lockdown. Bars and restaurants are closed, and Italy has banned travel between towns over Christmas. So the answer to the plaintive right-wing question, why can't we be like Sweden, is even Sweden doesn't want to be like Sweden anymore. Back after a short break. That was Lujain al Hathroul, a fierce women's rights activist in Saudi Arabia. Time magazine has called her a model of Saudi womanhood. Here she is in 2017 with Meghan Markle at a summit for young activists in Canada. She became famous for simply driving her car, an act that until 2018 was forbidden for women in the kingdom. For years, she fought bravely in Saudi Arabia's Women to Drive movement. She was arrested and released several times for attempting to drive from the UAE to Saudi Arabia. She and her husband discussed the ordeal in a 2016 interview with The Economist. The first day I was charged with uh, driving as a woman, and then the charge disappeared. A few weeks later, I was charged with inciting public opinion which was translated later on uh, into terrorist charges. I was, they tried to transfer me to the terrorist court, but I got out before that. In June 2018, the Saudi government granted women the right to drive for the first time in decades. So Lujain should be a hero in the kingdom, right? Wrong. She was effectively kidnapped on the side of the road in the UAE and forcibly returned to Saudi Arabia, where a month before the driving ban was lifted, Saudi Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman had her re-arrested, imprisoned, tortured, and possibly even sexually assaulted. Right now, Lujain is in solitary confinement in a Saudi prison cell, facing charges of terrorism. Yeah terrorism. Her family says she was beaten black and blue, horrifically tortured by electric shocks, strapped down and waterboarded for God knows how long. Why? Because she wanted to drive and she spoke out. 
What's happening to Lujane is inexcusable and deserves our full attention. And why should we in particular care? The Saudis are our allies. And yet the Trump administration has done nothing to try and have Lujain al Hathlul freed. Earlier I spoke with her sister, Lina al Hathlul about the campaign to get her released. Lina, your sister Lujain has been effectively kidnapped. She's been imprisoned. She's been tortured. How is she doing right now? Have you or your family been able to see her, speak with her, especially since her case was referred to a terrorism court? Yes, um, so my sister was on a hunger strike um, before the last um, session of the trial. And um, after being on a hunger strike for two weeks, they told her that um, she has a trial. And that's when they um, transferred her case to the terrorism court. Um, the case was dealt with the normal criminal court for one year and eight months. And after that, the judge realizes that he doesn't have any jurisdiction. And so he sent her case to the terrorism court. I would say that my sister is, um, it's been nearly three years that she's in pretrial detention, that she has been tortured, um, and that she doesn't have uh, the, her basic rights. Last time my parents saw her was during that um, trial session, which was on the 25th of November. Uh, Lujen was extremely weak. Uh, her body was shaking. Her, her eyes were uh, really tired, um, but she tried to stay strong and she wanted to read her defense herself. So psychologically, my sister is uh, very resilient. She's very strong, but they're really trying to exhaust her and to break her. And it's true, isn't it, that she was offered the chance of release from prison last year uh, if she agreed to do a statement on camera denying she'd been tortured or threatened, and she refused to do that. That takes an enormous level of courage and principle, which many of us just don't have. Where does she get that courage from? Has she always been that way? I mean, Lujain is, uh, we're also very impressed, her family, uh, we're, we have so much respect for that. And um, honestly, I cannot tell you um, where this courage comes from, but um, it's as impressive for us as well. And I think that um, Lujain is, um, believes in what she fights for, and she, um, she, she said it herself that if she accepts this, then she just allows her torturers to do the same uh, to people after, after her, and so she refused for this. It's uh, deeply impressive indeed. Uh, Lena, what do you make of the fact that Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman of Saudi Arabia, MBS, sells this image to the world of a new Saudi Arabia, a more tolerant, uh, liberal, tourist-friendly Saudi Arabia? He gets all this praise for allowing women to drive, and yet he locks up and tortures your sister, who he accuses of terrorism, your sister who was one of the women's rights activists who first put driving on the agenda in Saudi Arabia. I mean, I think um, there is no excuse anymore. Uh, at the beginning, we could um, believe him. Uh, but now, after everything we've seen, um, cutting a journalist into pieces, torturing activists, I think um, whoever believes him either is, not, e either is not informed anymore or is part of the cover-up. I mean, just for example, for my sister's case, at the very beginning in 2018, himself, he said it in an interview on Bloomberg that um, that my sister is um, a foreign spy, uh, that she's an agent, uh, and that he has evidence. He said it himself, that he has evidence and that he could show the videos the day after the interview. Um, it's been nearly three years. My sister ha has not been given any evidence of her accusations. Um, and then when we read the legal charges, they, ha they have nothing to do with, with what uh, MBS himself was saying. So we see that, you know, um, there are uh, different, to Saudi Arabia's now, the Saudi Arabia the West um, sees, so the one MBS wants them to, to think it is, and the Saudi Arabia, the people, Saudi people live under. And I will say, for example, you know, it's, it's, of course there are changes, but they're not structural, they're not institutional, and they're not deep. So, for example, uh, many people have talked about uh, women being able to travel without a male guardian, but no one talks about the uh, disobedience law, which basically allows the male guardian to still uh, forbid a woman from traveling. So if you don't have a good male guardian, then he can forbid you from um, enjoying all the new freedoms. So we see that it's just um, yeah. um, things have been changed um, on a surface, I would say. 
And there's no pressure on MBS at all from this administration. I want to play you a clip from the Time 100 gala in 2019 where comedian Hassan Minhaj mentioned your sister. Have a listen. This is a very powerful room. And, you know, I know there's a lot of very powerful people here. And it'd be crazy if, I don't know, if there was just like a... I don't know, like if there was like a high-ranking official in the White House that could WhatsApp MBS and, and say, hey, maybe you could help that person get out of prison because they don't deserve it. But that'd be crazy. That'd be, I mean, that person would have to be in the room. He was obviously taking a dig at Jared Kushner there, who was in the room that night, and is a pal of MBS as they text each other. Uh, Kushner was in Saudi Arabia last week. Do you think he brought up Lujane's plight while he was there? I mean, I, I don't know if he has, but what I can say is that we know that um, the U.S. are Saudi Arabia's biggest ally, and they have a lot of leverage on this. And I think that uh, my sister's case and the other activists' case have been uh, mediatized, and no one can say that they don't know about them. So if the U.S. wanted to... Um, um, to do something about it, I think they, they could. Um, it's their decision to stay silent, and I think, um, yes, uh, they could have acted in a different way. Yes, and so the Trump administration, Jared Kushner and others have abandoned your sister. Uh, what's your message to President-elect Joe Biden in regard to Lujain? Uh, because Biden has been a long-time ally of the uh, long Biden has been a long-time ally of the Saudis, but recently he's also called the kingdom a pariah. Do you have a message for Joe Biden on behalf of your sister? Yes, my message is quite clear, I think. Um, and he said it himself. Uh, there is no way we can go back to no business as usual with Saudi Arabia. Um, there is no place for civil society inside of the country. The Saudi, the Saudi authorities don't want to talk to us anymore. So the only way that we can uh, bring our voice uh, to the Saudi authorities and ask for the release of the real reformers inside of the country, including my sister, is, is by our allies urging and pressuring uh, the kingdom to do so. So I think that um, before everything, and as a precondition to continue their relations with Saudi Arabia, uh, Pres President-elect Joe Biden should um, ask for the release of uh, Lujain, my sister, and uh, all the other um, political prisoners. Well, I hope he does it. Let's see if he does. Alina al Hathlul, we appreciate you taking time out. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Finally tonight. On this day, 79 years ago, the United States was attacked by Japan when it bombed the American fleet at Pearl Harbor. On that December the 7th, a total of 2,403 soldiers, sailors, marines and civilians lost their lives. For millions of Americans, it was a day of unimaginable loss. The top Japanese admiral was rumored to have said that Pearl Harbor awakened a sleeping giant. This year, the loss is especially poignant. On each of the first five days of December, more Americans died of COVID-19 than in the attack on Pearl Harbor. This December, every day has been Pearl Harbor Day. The only question is when and how we will awaken from our collective slumber and fully fight back against the enemy that is COVID-19. That does it for me tonight. I'll see you back here tomorrow night here on Peacock, live from 7 p.m.